myself briefly about it. <laughs> <laughs> One of the weird things about about growth or trying to make your ideas always become new is that you always assume you're going to uh, to uh, know what the next step is. That even though you're going to become more and more enlightened, there won't be any surprises. In, and uh, <laughs> so a few weeks ago, I was meditating in my usual fashion, and uh, I began to get this new idea, which was so weird that I immediately shifted into, aha, this is, this is not the truth. This is not a transmission about the nature of reality. This is a plot for a science fiction novel that I, <laughs> that I should write and tried to hold that as the defense. That was my shield against the onslaught of this thing. And I've never been one for Atlantis or Lemuria or all these invisible prehistoric lands and places that people enjoy so much. But I was told a very funny thing, which I will share with you. It's uh, a funny idea. Now, let's see. How does it go? It has two versions, one of which speaks a scientific language, the other speaks a mythological language. Okay, so the scientific language goes like this. There's something in the universe called a fractal soliton of improbability. This means it's a unicate event. It only happens once in the lifetime of a universe. You can think of it as a wavelength with one wave. That's why it's called a soliton. And if one of the and these things move not in ordinary three-dimensional space, but but in some kind of much higher spatial manifold, and when they collide with a planet, or when one collides with a planet in a universe, the time stream of that planet is divided, and two copies of the entire planet spring into existence without either having any knowledge of it. It just is something which happens. So this voice was telling me that uh, this had happened to the earth and that this was the secret that we were all striving to understand was that a, an event in the past had actually divided our time stream and that a twin of this planet had come into being in another dimension. Okay, so that's the scientific explanation of it. So the mythological explanation was that there that the universe it's Gnostic, that the universe is the creation of a demiurge, not the highest expression of divinity, but a kind of demon, a fallen creature. And that this demiurge was able to coax itself into being and actually incarnate into history as a human being and that when this happened this was then the mythological expression of the fractal soliton of improbability and when it happened the time stream split the universe is the creation of the demiurge and the demiurge impelled itself in in the form of an individual right and this is sort of you know waited a long time when you're a demiurge <laughs> who can hurry <laughs> okay, go ahead. Okay, so so the time splitting event had to do with the career of Christ, who was an extraordinary manifestation of energy in the historical time stream, not to be confused with a Buddha or a Mohammed or a Zoroaster who were great saints and uh, it, it was something else. It was in some sense what it claimed to be but in some sense, okay? So now, at the moment of, and you can choose either the Immaculate Conception or the Resurrection, depending on which side of the bed you got up on today, <laughs> but at that moment, the time stream split, and this other place came into being without having any awareness, that, and they were identical at that moment, these two worlds. Now, Christ had no children, so, oh, what I forgot to say was that the event, the fractal soliton of improbability, has this quantum mechanical half-charge so that in one of the universes it happens 
In the other universe, it doesn't happen. And so everything about these two worlds was the same, except that in one of them, the Immaculate Conception had not taken place, or the Resurrection had not taken place. Now, because Christ had no children, in the world in which he was absent, it was not a genetic line which was missing. It was an ideological line which never received expression. And consequently, as time passed, first decades and then centuries, the absence of this particular intellectual influence in the world changed the world radically. In the fall of Greek science did not suffer the suppression that occurred with the conversion of Constantine. The academies were not closed. The hermetic knowledge was not repressed. Conversely, the empire was stronger and was able to repel the barbarian invasions of the second to the fifth century. And, and mathematics, which had halted in our world at Diophantus, proceeded through his disciple Hypatia to develop a calculus by A.D. 370 so that the millennium of Christian stasis that occurred in our world did not occur in that world. And as time passed and engineering advances occurred, by around 850, they had ships which were able to cross the Atlantic Ocean and they encountered the Mayan civilization reaching its fullest flower on, in Guatemala and on the Yucatan Peninsula. And in fact, in this vision, I saw the Roman Emperor Cosmodorus V make a pilgrimage to Tikal in 920 to be present at the coronation of a king at the end of Bakhtun VIII. <coughs> anyway, this Greco-Roman imperial culture immediately recognized the genius of the Mayans in mathematics and astronomy, and, and Europe was transformed into a, an amalgamation, a Greco-Mayan civilization with the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so let me see. <laughs> and and this civilization continued to develop. Now, one of the influences which the Mayans brought into Europe around the year 950 was their extremely sophisticated psychopharmacopoeia and shamanism. And this mated with Neoplatonism and Hermeticism so that rather than science developing as it developed in our world, a kind of magical psychopharmacolytic technology of thought and understanding was what was developed over the centuries. And then in later centuries, centuries before it happened in our world, they contacted the Orient. And the Sung, the dynastic influence of the Sung, poured itself into the creation of a global civilization such that by around 1200 AD, they were able to land on the moon and create a cybernetic global civilization similar to the kind we have now. They continued evolving with all this psychotronic and shamanically derived, and now by this time you can imagine it was an unbelievably exotic and alien uh, civilization compared to our own. The fruits of their psychedelic and psychoanalytic investigations into higher space was the discovery of our world they found out <laughs> what had happened. <laughs> they figured it out by studying dreams and by making deep journeys into the psychedelic space. They were able to discover our sleeping unconscious with its repository of the legacy of the Christian centuries under the reign of this demiurgic ideology. And they conceived of the notion of saving us and it, it has to do with this whole thing about the UFOs and influence in dreams and astral traveling and the other side is actually the manifestation of this bizarre Greco-Mayan 
postmodern star-faring civilization trying to reach across the dimensions to save us from the momentum of our history by making us aware of first of all their existence and also their technology which is evolving toward a point where I think around the Mayan millennium around 2012 the time island will be f we will flow past the time island and the two time streams will be rejoined and we will make peace with this civilization which is now a thousand years more advanced than us with this totally different cultural history and this completely different take on reality so this came to me in the space of about 15 seconds <laughs> <laughs> and uh, more details have flowed in and I use it mostly as a meditational device because it's so interesting to ask to be told about how this other civilization developed its amazing exoticism you know its neoplatonism its Taoism its Mayan influences melded into a completely different kind of civilization than the one that we inherited I've always thought you know that the that uh, Christianity without making any judgment about Christ himself that Christianity is hands down the single most reactionary force in all of human history and where would we be had that 1200 years not been given over to this peculiar meditation you know all the pieces were in place for the kind of civilization that I've outlined it was just uh, coincidence cat does not uh, endorse this idea <laughs> or <laughs> even encourage it <laughs> he only told it to me a couple of days ago in Apache Junction in a truck stop or something you know, I, and he didn't tell me it as the plot for a science fiction novel he said this is the truth and then I said let's get back to it being a good science fiction novel <laughs> Well, the thing is that it, it would, on our level, explain perhaps the questions you were asking earlier of why the teaching plants. Y sure. Yeah. The, the, uh, uh, another thing I was curious while you were talking about this is the, the, the physics of nowadays. You know, it's like if you have an electron on one side of the universe and split it into two and separate them by the universe, they're still in communication with each other. So is that why, logically, you can bring the time island back together again? Yeah, this you would be a quantum mechanical super macrophysical Bell's theorem event, a, yeah, kind, of, yeah. a kind of hyperdimensional vacuum fluctuation where the two worlds spring apart, sail along for a period, and then parity is conserved and they're rejoined. You well, know. this is interesting. I've had dreams that yes. are parallel, what dreams you're describing really here, like and that. it's very interesting that you bring this up. I've not heard of it before. And, uh, <laughs> it, uh, it's a... <laughs> It, it, another thing I was curious is like this takes place and you know uh, this would be on a human experience level of uh, what you're speaking of now the, the plant kingdom would they remain in uh, connection Good between the, the species uh, we're free like to have it any way we like. <laughs> <laughs> so it's how has Christianity possibly affected the evolution of plant species in this time stream well, as we opposed to the other? Have they gone on very How, how does our lack of, say, 100,000 or million species in the last 200 years mm -hmm. that the other planet has, how does that affect the parity between the two? Uh, you mean how does our destruction and contort exactly. well the part of the myth that I didn't tell you which I will now tell you <laughs> was uh, that uh, naturally well they were developing and exploring technical options many hundreds of years ago and they uh, theoretic they discovered the theoretics for nuclear fusion and fission but they never used it I until a few hundred years later one of their great theoreticians this was after they had discovered our time stream made the prediction that the physics of atomic explosions were such that they would cross the time stream and so they performed an experiment by detonating an atomic device in what is our year 1907 
and this was yes, the sir. Tunguska, <laughs> the Tunguska <laughs> event. And then by monitoring the dreams of Siberian shaman, which they had in clear focus, they saw, aha, this explosion which we set off actually did occur in both time streams. And at that point, they became very interested in monitoring our uh, time stream because they were picking up the dreams of a Swiss telegraph worker <laughs> who seemed to be pushing toward an unimaginable conclusion. So now there is a certain amount of urgency because if we explode our atomic stockpiles, it will wreck the place that they call home world. Butter. Yes. Yes, not self-preservation, because they now have star flight and encompass many systems, but preservation of home world, which on the other side is a vast botanical and ecological preserve from pole to pole. I mean, it's a sacred site of pilgrimage. It's uh, the, the home of the species. It's the earth. And the notion that suddenly great parts of it will be blown apart by leakage from hyperspace of one of our atomic wars is impelling them now to attempt to open the doorway and rejoin the time streams and will be allowed a few years inside the botanical park to acclimate and then most people will ship off for the stars, I imagine. <laughs>